We've got something very special lined up for that. Uh, as we'll do a bit of housekeeping first. If you hear the fire alarm, we don't have any drills planned. Assume it's genuine. Everybody leave via the main doors that you came in, and the muster point is off to the left. Got that? Good. Um, Stuart, who would ordinarily be here to introduce our guest speaker, sends his apologies. He can't make it, he's tied up. And he did, like a good academic, send me a long list of facts and figures that I could read about our speaker today, but I've decided not to bore you with that. <laughs> There'd be nothing left for you to say if I did, eh? So all that remains to be said is please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Glenda Young. Oh, thank you. So can everyone hear me all right? I've got a little microphone on. I hope you can hear me, yeah? Well, I'll assume everything's going to work all right. Um, so I'm Glenda, and thank you very much indeed for coming this afternoon. Um, I am a little bit nervous, so bear with me. And I'm aware that I'm being live streamed as well on the internet. So it's making me, uh, if I run out screaming, <laughs> you'll know why. Hopefully I'll stay. So um, I am from Riot originally. And I've always wanted to be a writer all of my life, ever since I was a little girl. But I grew up in Riot, which is a working class village. Um, I grew up in a council estate. And during the 1970s, when I was growing up, there were just no opportunities for kids like me to get involved in, you know, writing was just a, a dream. I might as well have told my mum and dad I wanted to be an astronaut. And then at least they could have told me, sent me to the library and got books out about space travel. As far as being a writer was concerned, there was just no hope. So it was always something that I used to love doing. Um, and I'd write poems and stories and make up all sorts of uh, essays and plays. But I never really had anything, anywhere to send the work to or anybody to read it and critique it. Um, so I left school at 15, started working in an office straight away. All the time I was writing in my spare time, always. Um, I'm a huge Coronation Street fan. Now, this is, does have a bearing on my writing life. I started a, a Coronation Street fan website. This was over 25 years ago. And at the same time, I went to university, at Sunderland University, as a very mature student to study journalism. And as part of the journalism degree, I had to find my own work placement. So I put a note on the Coronation Street fan website to say, does anybody want me for three weeks? I need a work placement. I've got a very creative and hardworking pair of hands and I can write. So ITV got in touch and that was really where everything changed for me. ITV got in touch and said, would you like to come in to the office, the Coronation Street press office for your work placement? So as a fan, that was just an amazing opportunity. I got to work behind the scenes, I was working with scripts, I met some of the cast. It, it remains the most surreal three weeks of my life, just incredible. And I was working on a book called Behind the Scenes at Coronation Street. So after I graduated, um, ITV kept in touch and they asked me to update some more of their books. And then when the actress Anne Kirkbride died, I don't know if you remember the character of Deidre Barlow in Coronation Street, of Deidre with her perm and the big glasses and married to Ken, the most boring man in soap. Um, when Anne Kirkbride, the actress, died, ITV got in touch with me and said they'd like me to write the tribute book to the character of Deidre. And this had never been done before on, with ITV Coronation Street. They hadn't ever had a book that was dedicated to one character. So it was a real honor, a real honor to do that book. And all the time that I was writing the Coronation Street books and then doing the Deirdre book, I just kept thinking, I really want to create my own strong women. I want to create my own fiction. I was aware that Deirdre and characters like Elsie Tanner and Rita and all of these amazing women were characters that someone else had created and I was just writing about them. So I really wanted to create my own strong women, my own fiction. So I started writing short stories for women's magazines. I've got one of them here. And the People's Friend magazine, which you might know, it's the world's longest running women's magazine. You might think it's a little magazine that only old people read, but it's a powerhouse of a magazine and it's absolutely changed my life. The People's Friend started taking my short stories and then they said, we know about your Coronation Street books. How would you like to start writing our first ever weekly soap opera for the magazine? So I had a bit of a wobble at first. I thought, I don't think I can do this. 
every week. No, that's not me. But I, I gave it a try. And since 2016, I've been writing their soap opera. It's called Riverside, and it's in the back of the magazine. And even though I've written my novels now, and I've written crime novels, which I'll tell you about, writing Riverside remains the writing highlight of my week because it's so funny. It's contemporary. It's set in a town that used to build ships. <laughs> Might sound familiar. Um, the shipyards have long gone, and people are in a state of flux. They're in a state of change. But at, at its heart of Riverside is a story of uh, Ruby and Mary, two women, two friends. So on the strength of Riverside, that's how I got a literary agent in London. And this all happened uh, just after 2016, 2017. So after wanting to be a writer all of my life, you know, in the last sort of 10 years or so, it's really only just happened. I've been able to leave work and now I dedicate myself full time to writing and I just, I couldn't be happier. I feel like I'm finally living my childhood dream. It took a while coming around, but, but it's, I've got it. So when I got a literary agent, she said, um, come down to London to meet me. She said, and bring some ideas with you. She said, what we need is a strong story with a good sense of place. It needs to be set between the wars. And my heart sank because I thought, I've got no interest in history. I don't know the first thing about it. I don't know where to start. Um, and she said, so it needs good sense of place, set between the wars. She said, think about a really strong heroine that you can throw everything on the kitchen sink at. Lots of obstacles for her to overcome. So I went down to London with a list of ideas and I had it completely wrong. So I went down thinking strong women, right? So I had an idea about suffragettes in the Northeast and she said, no, don't, don't, don't want that. I had an idea about a fictional account of um, Red Ellen's life, Ellen Wilkinson, the Jarrow MP who marched with the Jarrow marches. She said, no, that's no good. So I had, I had more on the same theme, and I was looking on my list despairing. I thought, I'm not even going to mention them to her. I thought, I've really blown this chance. And she said, what else have you got on your list? And on the Grand Central train going down to London that day, I'd sort of scribbled some notes, and I was thinking rags to riches. And I said, oh, well, I've got this idea about a girl who takes on her dad's rag and bone round. And uh, she sat up straight in her seat. And she said, oh, tell me more. And I said, I haven't got any more. I said, really, that's as far as I've got. I said, but if she's got a rag and bone round, she'll have a horse. And she went, horses sell books. And I said, she'll have a dog as well. <laughs> and um, she said, dogs sell books. She said, go home and write me a synopsis of what's going to happen in this rags to riches story. So it was the book that became Belle of the Backstreets, my debut novel. Um, and we had three publishers fighting over it. And when I, when I say that now, when I think about what happened, and I think about nine-year-old me at home in Rye, who always wanted to be a writer, and then having three major publishers fighting over the book, it was incredible. So I chose Headline as my publisher, and I've been with them ever since, and they're the ones who publish my crime novels as well. But I'll tell you why I turned to crime. So when the publisher said, well, sorry, when the agent said the books need a strong sense of place, I knew there was only one place I could write about with conviction, and that was Sunderland. And then because of my soap opera writing, I thought I'm going to narrow it down even further, and I'm going to narrow it down to a village of Ryup, where I grew up. Now, I thought I knew Ryup because I'd grown up there, but it was only when I started researching that I realised how little I knew. I didn't realise how productive it was, how affluent it had been in its heyday when the pit was open. So I'm going to take you on a lovely nostalgic look back at old Ryup, uh, the mining village, the farming community, and I'm going to explain how old pictures and what I've been learning about Ryup has inspired the novels as well. The novels are not a series, they're individual books, you can read them in any order. They're all set at the end of World War I, and even though I had no interest in history, or at least I thought I didn't when I started writing the books, the research now has become my favourite part. I'm absolutely absorbed in that, in that era. It was a time of great change for society, but especially for women. It was the first time women had been out en masse in, into the workforce because of the soldiers being away at war. The women had to take on jobs outside of the home. At the end of World War I, women were expected to go back into the home, and not a lot of them wanted to do that. So I've got some fantastic female characters in the books. So let's have a look. This picture um, 
at the start of the presentation shows Ryab Hall. I don't know if anybody knows Ryab Village very well, but Ryab Hall used to stand where Cranston Place is now on the village green. And the people I write about in the books are the people who worked in the, the grand houses, the domestic staff, the gardeners, the cooks, the cleaners. So these are the books so far. There are eight of them. It's been non-stop ever since I signed with the publisher. Um, it's such an amazing feeling to get a book deal. It was like nothing I've experienced in my life before. And then the reality sinks in and you have to sit down with a pair of comfortable trousers on and just crack on with the work. And I love every single minute. It's hard work sometimes, but it's well worth it. I can bring old Riot to life. So this is Riot Pit, 1900. The pit was sunk in Riot in the 1860s and it closed in 1966. At the height of the pit in the 1930s, there were over 4,000 men and boys working there. Riot was all fields and farms before the pit was sunk. Um, sunk sinking the pit changed Riot forever. These are some of the boys with a, one of their bosses heading off down the pit. No protective headgear, nothing, just a miner's lamp. Um, the book that I took this from said that the, the overseer, the overman, had a safety stick. And what he used to do with that piece of equipment was he would go into a, a coal seam, use the stick to tap it against the ceiling of the steam. If it didn't fall in, he would send the boys in to get the coal out. It was very dangerous work, lots of... Uh, men and boys died at the pit. But it's the women that I love writing about the most. This is Riot Ladies football team of 1919. Now, obviously, photographs from that age are all black and white, but I would love to think those stripes are red on their tops. Who knows, red and white stripes. These ladies are, um, during the minor strike of 1921, there's, I came across lots of adverts in the Echo where women's football team would play each other at sort of charity matches to raise money to feed children during the strikes. And this is one of those games. It's difficult to know why there are two nurses at either end. <laughs> um, and the other thing you can't really see in this photograph is that the women are playing in their, their husband's pit boots as well. So maybe that does explain why the nurses are there. This is a scene, if you go to Ryup now, it hasn't changed much. The, um, the agricultural and the farming community was very much at the heart of Ryup before the pit was sunk. When I was growing up in the 1970s in Ryup, it, it was still very much a, a dairy and a, a farming community as well. And you, know, you, you, you would see the cows walking around the village. I love this particular photograph because I think this cow has gone on a recce. And she's like, come on, girls, <laughs> we can cross now. But this was a regular sight as far up, you know, to late 1970s, early 1980s in Riot. The farming community was as important as the mining community. One of the major buildings from Riot is now being rebuilt at Beanrish. In fact, it's going to be opening next year. Um, very proud to say that uh, Ryup's Grand Electric Cinema has been, um, it's going to be the centrepiece of the 1950s town at Beamish. If you go to Beamish, do go and have a look. Uh, it should almost be ready for opening. I think they're talking about spring next year. Um, I'm now a member, so for someone who didn't like history, I'm now a member of Ryup Heritage Society. Um, and we were all invited into Beamish when they were putting the roof tiles on the um, the Grand Electric there, and we, they gave us pens to write our names on the roof tiles. You won't be able to see them, they'll go inside, but to know there's a, a part of Ryup Heritage is in there, it's wonderful. Um, and I've just recently bought and dedicated a seat to my mum and dad, who used to go courting, so that my mum and dad will be in there for at least 15 years, they say. So I work from the old maps, and I absolutely love poring over old maps. And this is one that I use and I keep on my wall. It shows where the co-op was, where the, the, the shops and the pubs were. Um, it's just, and then you, when I find pictures, I find a picture that had a passing place for trams written on it. And I thought, where, where could that be? And it's where the road widens out. So using the maps and old pictures, it's almost like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. And it's one that I really enjoy. 
you know, put, just putting things together and trying to build up as much of a picture as right as I possibly can. It's impossible to know what it was really like over 100 years ago, but I try my best and I try to put that into the books the best way I can. So this is the patting place for trams on the Colliery Bank. Um, it's actually now where there's a bus stop, so it is where the road kind of widens out a little bit on the, on the bank. Um, the Engines Museum that Raya, has anybody ever been to that? It's definitely worth seeing. They, they do open it every, I think on bank holidays for steaming weekends, a group of volunteers who run it. It's an absolutely fabulous place. And these are some of the slum housing that were pulled down in the 1930s. So these are the sort of things, the sort of housing that I write about in the books. Um, these are the back streets in Bella the Back Streets and the Pit Lanes in Pearl of Pit Lane. Really ruinous conditions, absolutely dreadful places to live. It's the train station at Ryab, one of the two train stations. I, I, I knew we always had one train station in Ryab, but I actually found out there were two, one for the coal and one for passengers. So this is what remains on the, on the year. I think I've got a laser pointer here. I'm going to press this button. Oh, maybe on it. So that's, what's, that's what remains of the train station. The train station plays a hugely important role in all of my novels because it's where uh, the heroines for each book either come in to riot by train or they leave. Um, it's, it's really important. This is Riot Co-op, beautiful old building. It's really gorgeous. My dad used to work at the co-op when I was a kid. Um, it's long gone now, though, but it features in all of the books. It was Ryab's biggest employer after the pit, and it employed a lot of women, especially during World War I. It had a hall upstairs as well for dancing, and they used to put side sh slideshows on. And that's what it looks like now. What a shame. <laughs> but it, the building is being used. It's a gym now. It's just recently been converted over to a gym. So at least it's not derelict, which is something. But uh, yes, such a beautiful old building now. It's gone. So, this is St Paul's Church in Riot Village. I don't know if anybody's ever been in the church. Um, when, when I started researching for my very first book, Bell of the Backstreets, uh, my great niece was christened. And Reverend Chadwick, the vicar at St Paul's Church, came along to the, the after party, if you like, for the christening. He was singing on the karaoke. If anyone knows the Reverend David Chadwick from Riot St Paul's, he's a, he's a wonderful chap. His nickname is Disco Dave. He does like a party. So he came along to the party and he was, it, I, I was telling him I was researching a book set in 1919. And he said, did I know that the vicar at that time was called Canon Knight and he was a real maverick? Well, I knew nothing about him. So I met with um, Reverend Chadwick and he loaned me a book all about Canon Knight. And this chap, he loved Ryup so much and he did his best to get the miners and the farming community together because they were very much, they kept themselves to themselves. So he went out of his way to get the miners to come into church. And there are two stories in the book that I read, which it bear repeating. The first one is that Canon Knight saw some miners going to work one day and he collared them in the street and he said, I haven't seen you fellas in church before. Why don't you come this weekend with your families? And one of them sort of blustered up to the vicar and said, you've got more chance of knocking me out in the street, vicar, than getting me, out, getting me to church on Sunday. So the vicar punched him out, and he was unconscious on the ground. And that Sunday, the, the miner and his friends and all their families were in church. So he was just very unusual methods to get people into church. And the other story is that um, there was a fight in the street outside the church, so the vicar rushed out and got into the middle of the fight, got the miners apart from each other, and got a black eye for his trouble. This must have been on a Saturday because the book says the following day in church, so I'm guessing it was a Sunday sermon, um, no one could concentrate on what the vicar was saying because it, he had a black eye. So, but he, was, he was very, very, had very high morals as well. Uh, there was a dressmaker's shop in Ryup that had a mannequin in the window that was in the process of being changed. So you know, it was just a, a, a mannequin. And, and the vicar went in and took it out of the window. He thought it would upset people's morals. And he walked home, apparently. He had the mannequin under his arm and he walked home with it. Uh, he, if you do ever go to St Paul's Church, you'll see a, um, a blue plaque outside of the church now 
where Canon Knight is buried. He wanted to be buried at that church. He was quite an amazing man. Um, but Reverend Chadwick is as well. He's, he's tremendous. I'm not a churchgoer, I must admit. But Reverend Chadwick has helped me with research for all of the books. He's absolutely incredible. So, this book, Sunland Antiquarian Society, historic look at the pubs of Ryup and Silksworth, and Ryup's got a lot of pubs. Mining and farming were very thirsty work. There's a st if you know Ryup, you'll know there's a string of pubs all the way down from the top, down, around the village. It's just pretty much one after the other, even though some of them are now closed down. When I got this book, and uh, Ron Lawson's books at the Sunderland Antiquarian Society, he's got them for all areas of Sunderland, so if you're interested in the history of pubs in your area, do buy one of these books. It lists every single pub and has the names of all of the landlords and landladies who ever owned the pub. And the first thing I noticed when I had a look at the one for Ryup was that the names above the door um, uh, during and just after World War I and World War II were women. And I thought, these women could not have been shrinking violets. Not, not with a village full of miners and, and farmers, heavy drinkers. So that's what inspired most of the characters in my books. The, these are really strong, tough women. Not just running the pubs, running the families, looking after the, the miners who were out. It's, the pit baths weren't built until 1930s. So these were miners who were coming home and having to be scrubbed in front of the fire in a tin bath. So Bell of the Back Streets was my first book. Was a, I love this old picture, looking up the colliery bank. It looks like there might be a horse and cart up on the, on the bank there as well. So this is the girl who takes on her dad's rag and bone round. A lot of this book is set down here in the East End, where the markets were. Uh, it's, it, it's tremendous. This is the book that we had three publishers fighting over, and it's the, the start of my writing life. There's some fantastic characters in here, and a horse, and a dog. <laughs> Each of my books features very strongly at least one of the pubs in Ryup, and for Belle of the Backstreets, it's the Albion. So this is what the Albion used to look like and what it looks like now. Um, sadly, the Albion's closed until next year. I think it's uh, just falling victim to the way that most, a lot of places are these days. So. It's unfortunately, it's closed at the moment, but it's a lovely old pub, a lot of history in there. The Tuppenny Child is the next book. This is about a girl who comes from Hartlepool, um, who's a foreigner. She's, she's, she turns up in Ryup with only the clothes that she's wearing. She doesn't have any friends there. She doesn't know anyone. She's got no money. She gets off the train. The first, the first building that she sees when she gets off the train is the Railway Inn pub. She goes in there and it changes her life and it sets her off on an adventure. I won't spoil anything for you, but she, she's looking for something that's been stolen from her. When she finds out who has got this thing that's been stolen from her, there's a real class war to get it back. Lots of class wars in my book. And the Tuppany Child was based on this picture I found at Carlisle Marketplace shows a young girl accepting a shilling which contracted her in domestic service. And I just thought, when I see pictures like this, I always think, who was the photographer? Is this photograph staged? Or was it, did, did the photographer just see it and decided to take the picture as, as they were in the marketplace? And just the, the expression on that poor girl's face, um, that inspired the character, the main character for the Tuppany child. There's a lot of baking, <laughs> a lot of food in all of my books, actually. Bread making, especially pies, cakes. Um, and in The Tuppany Child, Sadie, the, the main character who comes from Hartlepool, she almost, becomes, she almost becomes a businesswoman, if you like, because she, well, she becomes the first woman in the village to wear trousers, to, work, to ride a bike, and she starts selling bread and pies around as well on her bike. So she's, uh, although she starts with nothing, she... She does have something about her. And I use the old recipes from the, the very first B-roll books as well. And while I was researching this particular book, a friend of mine in Dublin, on January the 6th, posted on social media, Happy Women's Christmas to all my Irish friends. And I said, what's the Women's Christmas? Does anybody know about this? Because I didn't know about it either. And so my friend Emma, 
said, in, Jan in Ireland, on January the 6th, women celebrate their own Christmas. And I didn't know about this, and I was absolutely blown away. So I Googled it straight away to find out what it was. And it's an ancient tradition. It's called Little Christmas, and then it was nicknamed the Women's Christmas. So women get together, not to exchange presents, but to tell stories. And it's a very, um, very much a cultural event in Ireland, even to this day, although it's kind of been hijacked by kind of um, drinks companies. Um, you know, people offer sort of three shots for two because it's Women's Christmas night, that sort of thing. But it's still very much celebrated. And when I found out about it, I thought, I'm going to have to put this in the book somehow. Well, it's not too much of a stretch to put Irish people in the riot books because a lot of Irish families came into riot to work at the pit. So I've created this wonderful Irish landlady called Bessie Brogan. She's a pub landlady. Um, and she brings with her the tradition of the Irish women's Christmas. So on January the 6th, she closes the pub and she will only let women in. Well, you can imagine this causes absolutely furory with the, the miners and the men of the village. Uh, they're not happy with her, but she doesn't care. There's a, they have this, there's, a just, there's a chapter in the book about the Irish women's Christmas. And I'll tell you more about that later. Pearl of Pit Lane is about a young girl who uh, tries to escape a life where she's expected to work on the, the back lanes of the pit, selling her body. And this was a, the book that the vicar David Chadwick helped me with a great deal because I needed to know where Pearl would run to if she was running away from home. And I thought she might spend a couple of nights hiding out in the church. So I said to the vicar, would you show me where a young child could sort of hide out? And he did, with, with, there were lots of places and I went up into the bell tower uh, at St. Paul's as well, which was just incredible. So Pearl does hide in the bell tower. Um, not for very long, obviously, because the bells were going to go off. I, I, I remember when I was up there, I kept nervously looking at my watch, thinking, I better leave soon. But when Pearl's in the bell tower and she's cold and it's dusty and all, everything she can smell, that's, that's because I was up there. I, you know, I, I like to ex experience the... I like to run my hands along walls and experience what my heroines are going through as, as much as I can. So, and the reason there's a proggy mat on this picture is because um, proggy mat making is a way that Pearl, um, she, she gets into making mats and selling them. And that's one of the ways she gets out of the world of prostitution that she's expected to go into. So I had to learn how to make a proggy mat. <laughs> I thought, I can't write about this without any conviction if I don't know how to do it myself. So I had my grandma's little progger, which fit perfectly in the palm of my hand. And it was, had this really quite... Uh, dangerous sort of spike on the end and when I was holding it I thought this would make a great weapon so it, it, do, it does end up as a weapon in the book as well so people say where do you get your ideas for your books from they come from all over the place but I did go to I spent a whole day at Beamish and learned how to make a proggy mat and it was a wonderful wonderful day um, we were upstairs in what is the bank in Beamish in the town in a private room and uh, it was a lovely sunny summer day. Um, we had the windows open and there was a brass band playing on the brass stand and the music was coming in. It was just the most special day. Really, really lovely. I don't think Beamish are doing their experiences anymore, um, which is a real shame. I had myself booked on one for a, a miner's, um, a pit lass experience, a miner's wife experience uh, for my book, The Miner's Last, but COVID put, paid to that, unfortunately. So then we've, we've got the girl with the scarlet ribbon. So this is my fourth book. And by now, I'm making sort of contact with other authors and I'm seeing what they're doing on Facebook. And some of them are off down to the south of France to do research, you know, and they're, or they're overseas writing. And I thought, I'm missing a trick here. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't drive, so I'm getting the number 39 bus to Ryeup to do my research. <laughs> well, where would I like to go if I could to write, to do some research? And I love Scarborough. It's my happy place. I thought, well, I'm going to set this book between the North East and Scarborough. Then I can go down and do some research. That's exactly what I did. So I learned that the Earl of Scarborough had a holiday home in Ryup. So again, there was that very tenuous connection. I thought, I'm going to play on this and we'll see how it goes. The girl with the scarlet ribbon opens with a baby being left on a doorstep. A doorstep of the biggest, most fancy house in Ryup. It's still there. If I've called it something different in the book, 
Um, but if you know where it is, you'll go and have a look and you'll see why I decided to set the book there. Um, I, I kind of hoped I might get a look around the house when I was writing the book, so I put a very nice letter through the door with some bookmarks and my phone number, and I said, could I please, you know, come and have a look around, and I'm going to be writing a book about your house. And they never got back in touch. But at the same time, the house went up for sale on Right Move. <laughs> so it meant I did virtually got to have a look around inside, which was nice. It was a beautiful house as well. So this one's set between the northeast and Scarborough. This is the house. And this is what it looked like over 100 years ago. It's hardly changed. It's just, it's on a street just behind the village green, just off the village green, um, between the village green and St. Paul's Church. It's gorgeous. It's called the wilderness, but I have called it something different in the book. Then the paper mill girl came out, set at Hendon Paper Mill, and I'm, I made the top 50 <laughs> UK bestseller chart, so I'm really particularly proud of this book. Um, and the, the Echo did a, a feature on me as well, which is really good. Um, I've got to thank, again, Sunderland Antiquarian Society for their help and support in... because um, I found it very difficult to find out information about Hendon Paper Mill. Edward Thompson Group, who bought the mill, or were the last owners of Hendon Paper Mill, I got in contact with them. Spent a wonderful afternoon with Paddy Cronin, who was the, the owner of Edward Thompson's. But the first thing he said to me was, oh, when we took over the paper mill, we threw everything away in the skip. And I've heard that so many times when I've gone to research. Um, so Sunderland Antiquarian Society had some pictures. I found the original floor plans at Tyne and Weir Archives. And I managed to put together a little bit of a picture about what life might have been like at Hendon Paper Mill. These are some of the pictures. These are the, the, the women workers. The women were working in rooms where they were counting the sheets of paper, um, or what they called the rag room, where they were actually cutting up clothes to pulp down to make paper as well. So I googled, <laughs> good old Google, um, I googled to see if there were any paper mills in the UK where I could go in and have a look around, and I found a place called Frogmore Paper Mill, which turns out to be the world's first mechanised paper mill. I became the paper mill queen. There wasn't anything you could ask me about paper mills that I didn't know when I was writing this book. So I went down to see them. I spent a couple of days down there. I made a sheet of handmade paper. They opened their archives to me. They had a visitor center. It was amazing, absolutely incredible. Um, so everything I learned at Frogmore in my head, I had to then put onto Hendon Paper Mill. Then came the miners' lass. Now, this one is very much set in a miner's family. The miner's lass, Ruby on the cover, uh, she's a miner's daughter. She, he, her brother's a miner, and she thinks she's going to marry a miner as well, but it turns out to be a bit of a wrong one. She's my most innocent heroine. Um, when the book came out in hardback, because they always come out in hardback three months before the paperback, had a different cover. So you can see she's looking a bit more stern and she's wearing a hat and she's got a dark uh, coat on. And the publisher, when my books go come out, first of all, in paperback, they go into supermarkets as well as Waterstones and WH Smiths and all the shops. Um, and they did some research. And their research showed that when the, the girl on the cover has got a hat on, they don't sell as well as girls with bare heads. So they changed the cover. So... <laughs> So I'm very pleased to be looked after by a very good publisher, one of, the, one of the best publishers in the country. So this, the Miners' Lass is set around the Toll Bar pub. I don't know if anybody can remember the Toll Bar Hotel. Yeah. So it's set around the Toll Bar pub, and there's a reason why I set it there. And it's to do with an old map. So there's the Toll Bar Hotel, PH, public house, marked on the map. And behind it are the words... Old Sand Pit. Now, this map is from 1921. So, Old Sand Pit, I don't know how old it was. I said to Sunderland Antiquarian Society, What do you know about the Old Sand Pit? And they said, Not much, but the only thing we do know is that it was nicknamed the Blood Pit. Well, for an author, a fiction writer, my mind just went off. And I thought, If there's bare knuckle fighting going on, um, it, because it was nicknamed the Blood Pit because of bare knuckle fighting and the people, people did lose their lives there. So I thought, if there's a bare knuckle fight going on, 
who is, who, what are they going to be fighting over? Or who are they going to be fighting over? And that's how I came up with my heroine, Ruby. I thought they'll be fighting over a woman. It'll be this girl I'm going to write about. And that's where the story developed from. So again, when people say, where do you get your ideas for your books from? It's three words on a map, old sand pit. This is another lovely old photograph. This is the Queen's Head pub in Ryup, looking down the bank. And this is where the miners' uh, last is set. And this is Cherry Knoll Hospital, or as it was called when it was first built, Sunderland Borough Lunatic Asylum. Um, the, the Miner's Last Boot does feature uh, a theme of mental health as well. So Cherry Knoll Hospital, or Sunderland Borough Lunatic Asylum, does feature very strongly in this book. And it's set during the miners' strike of 1921. So um, it's a time when the community came together to look after each other, and there were lots of soup kitchens. Um, this is a picture of one of them, using a tin bath to make the soup. And then came A Mother's Christmas Wish, which is my personal favourite book. Um, it came out last Christmas. Uh, the pictures around the cover are from Beamish. I always spend one day at Beamish, either just walking the streets and smelling cold smoke in the air, or behind the scenes, you can go into the resources centre and they let you, let you loose with all sorts of documents. Um, it returns to the theme of the Irish Women's Christmas because I loved writing about it so much in The Tuffany Child. For the first time, I brought some of those characters back. So although this book isn't a follow-on to The Tuffany Child, it does have the same characters. Um, and Bessie Brogan makes a comeback. And it'll break your heart. This book, I hope it breaks your heart because it broke mine when I was writing it. It's, it's beautiful. It starts with a girl called Emma, who's on the front of the cover, and I named her Emma after my Irish friend in Dublin, who told me about the Irish Women's Christmas. Uh, it starts with Emma, who has done something so dreadful and so shameful in her home village of Isle in Ireland, just outside of Dublin. And it's not because she's pregnant, it's actually something, she's done something worse. Um, she's done something so shameful that her mother sends her overseas and she sends her to her Aunt Bessie's pub in Ryup. Emma is very wayward. So by the time she arrives in Ryup, after she's come across on the boat to Liverpool and then she's got the train, well, various trains up to Ryup, um, by the time she arrives in Ryup, she's drunk, she's got a black eye, her hair's all over the place, she's lost the money that her mother gave her, and mother cooked her a pie, that's gone as well. She's a mess when she arrives in Ryup. At the end of the first chapter, she falls into our Aunt Bessie's pub and, and she's unconscious. And that's how we meet Emma. I don't knock all of our rough edges off during the course of the book. I, she's still wayward, but, but Ryup is a better place for having her in it by the end of the book. She's wonderful. It is my favorite book. It's a lovely old snowy scene of the village. The horse trough. Riot Village Green has still got its horse trough there. And then the Six Penny Orphan, which just came out in paperback earlier this year. This, is, um, this was inspired by this picture of these two young girls. And it was a picture that Sunderland Antiquarian Society put on their Facebook page. And again, it's, I saw the picture and I wanted to write about these girls. I didn't know who they were, where they lived, apart from they must have been in Sunderland if the Antiquarian Society had used the picture. I just wanted to write a story about them. So in the story, they're orphans. They're living with a really quite wicked woman who's bought them, basically, and then decides to sell them. Um, and I won't spoil it too much, but the book stops at a certain point, and then it jumps forward 10 years. In the first half of the book, the children are separated. In the second half of the book, they reunite 10 years later, and everything has changed. It, it's another heartbreaking one. And it's set in what was an old cafe on the village green, which is now a private house. Um, when I learned that this was a cafe, I thought I'm going to have to include that in one of my books. Um, so I haven't included it as a cafe. I've turned it into a bakery shop. But it does feature very heavily in the book. So something a little bit different. This is not to do with my book this time. Ryup had a library in the village. There were two, used to be two public libraries, but the one on the village green is now a block of apartments, and one of them is rented out as an Airbnb. 
And I know this because the woman who owns it got in touch and she said she's now having guests deliberately booking into the Airbnb so they can come to Riot to look for the locations in the books, which I just think is, it makes me so proud that people are doing that. It's incredible. Riot Junior School. This is the school that I used to go to. Um, and <laughs> one of the best things I've been asked to do um, since my book started getting published, was to give a talk and to open the school library at Ryup Junior School. So I was presented with a ribbon and some scissors and, and I opened the, the new school library, which is just wonderful because there are no libraries left in Ryup now. The only libraries are in the schools. So um, the, the head teacher said, um, you can come, you can stay all day, talk to the children, open the library, and if you want to, you can have your lunch with the staff in the staff room. Well, my mum used to be a dinner lady at Ryup Junior School, so I said, could I stay for my school dinner instead? And yes, so, so I did, and it was absolutely wonderful. The children were amazing. And at the end of the day, they all sat around, and I said, you can ask me any kind of questions you want, anything. So all the hands went up, and uh, the questions were, um, do you have brothers and sisters, and are they proud of you? I said, yes, I've got two brothers, and yes, they're very proud of me. They, neither of them read novels, but they'd read all of mine. Uh, another question was, um, do you like using brackets when you write? I said, oh, yeah, I like a bracket. And then this little girl, my granddad says, all writers are either liars or thieves, so which one are you? <laughs> and I said, well, I think your granddad might have a point because I sit at home and make things up for a living. So I said, do you tell your granddad that's a really good question? Oh, Elvis. Now, little known fact, he's a riot lad, but um, lockdown came and I couldn't get out to research. Now, there's a certain amount of research I could have done online, but it meant I couldn't get to Beamish, I couldn't walk the streets, I couldn't go to church. Now, I felt a bit stuck. Obviously, we couldn't leave the house and we all went through it and it was absolutely awful. So I thought, I'm going to do something different during, while I've got this time, I'm going to do something different. And I had an idea for a comedy novel, and it would star Elvis impersonators, because I think they're quite funny. And there'd be 12 of them, and they'd be called Twelvers. And they'd go to Scarborough, because Scarborough's my happy place. And while I couldn't leave the house during lockdown, in my imagination, I went to Scarborough. So I sent my agent a synopsis. I said, I want to write this story about Elvis impersonators. And she got on the phone, and she said, it's not really strong enough. She said, I think it would benefit from a murder. And I was like, oh, crikey. I don't know if I can write crime. Then I thought, hang on, there's crimes in most of those books and there's some villains and there's, you know, remember, remember the progger, there might, there might be a few murders. I thought, I can write crime. So I had to have a look to see what types of crime novels there were because it was a whole new genre to me. So I knew I didn't want to write anything gory and bloody because I didn't want to be upset going through lockdown was bad enough. Um, I didn't want to write police procedural because I didn't know anybody I could ask during lockdown. And then cozy crime. I thought, cozy crime, you've got your humor, you've got an amateur sleuth, there's no gore, there's never any blood, the murder takes place off screen, and it's all about the whodunits and the red herrings. I thought, bingo, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna kill off one of the Elvis impersonators, and I'm gonna, he'll have his blue suede shoes stolen. And away we went. Um, headline, I sent it off to Headline, my publisher. They loved it. And they said, can we have three? We want a series of three. So the third one has just, only just come out last week. It starts with um, Helen Dexter, who's the landlady of a small bed and breakfast in Scarborough. And her husband, Tom, has just recently died. Now, Tom was a massive Elvis fan. So... Helen, on the very first page, Helen is, she's got a dilemma. Does she stay at the hotel and try and run it on her own without Tom? Or does she sell up and move away? She doesn't know what to do. So she takes the dog for a walk on the beach and she's talking out loud to her husband and she's told, I need a sign, Tom. I need, I need to know what to do. When she gets home, the phone rings and it's Elvis Warren on the phone. And he says, I don't suppose there's any chance you could take 12 of us this weekend for the Elvis fan convention. He said, Elvis 5 was supposed to book us in to a hotel and he made a, he made a mess of the booking, so we're not booked in. 
So Helen takes that as her sign, and she reopens the hotel. She gets the gang back together. She calls her cleaner, Sally. She calls her cook, Jean, and Jean is a wonderful character. She's almost a surrogate mum to Helen. The three women, Helen, Jean, Sally, and the rescue dog, Suki, they become the amateur sleuths. It's, it's funny, it's touching, and there's a murder to solve as well. So, um, yes, last year, the series was nominated for Best New Crime Series at Harrogate Crime Festival. Um, so I went, I knew I wasn't going to win. I mean, Richard Osman and Val McDermott, there was just no way I was going to win. But I went to Harrogate Festival anyway, because I'd never been before. It was an amazing night. Val McDermott was there, Richard Osmond wasn't, but he won. So the compare said, Richard Osmond's won, we all gave him a round of applause, and he's put a tab behind the bar for everyone. So everyone queued up at the bar, we're thinking, oh, what a nice man Richard Osman is. Everyone queued up. Um, if you've read Richard Osman's Causey Crime, the Thursday Murder Club, one, then one of the main characters is called Elizabeth. So the idea was he had to go to the bar at the Old Swan in Harrogate, which was like, really expensive, and he had to say, Elizabeth sent me, and then ask for your drink. So we're all shuffling forward in this really long queue, and people are coming away from the bar saying, oh, cheers, Elizabeth, I've got my gin and tonic. So I get finally, after about half an hour, I'm at the bar, the bar's there. And I said, oh, Elizabeth sent me, could I have a glass of white wine, please? And she said, oh, I'm sorry, the tab's run out. <laughs> so to his credit, he did put some more money behind the bar later that night. But um, yeah, so thwarted twice in one night by Richard Osman. But to be, to be nominated and shortlisted, there were only six of us on the shortlist, is a real, real honor. Um, and I, I, so I've, that's what I've been doing for, ever since lockdown is writing in the two different genres, historical riot, modern um, Scarborough for the cosy crimes. So what's coming next? And this is really exciting. Does anybody know Chesterley Street? There used to be there used to be a toffee factory in Chesley Street called Horner's Toffee Factory, and they made a brand of toffee called Dainty Diner. I came across those two words, Dainty Diner, when I was researching my very first novel, Belle of the Back Streets, and it's just two words that's just never left me alone, Dainty Diner Toffee. So I finally got to write about the toffee factory. I can't call it Horner's, it has to be called something else, and I can't call it Dainty Diner, it's called something else. But to all intents and purposes, it's Horner's Toffee Factory and it's Dainty Diner. And it's just, it's absolutely tremendous. So this comes out next year and it's a trilogy of books as well. So this is the first one. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, the research for, for the, to the history of toffee making has just been, it's been so interesting. Been down uh, to the University of York to look through the Roundtree and Macintosh archives um, did a lot of work in Halifax as well. It's amazing. I can't wait for, I'm so excited about this. I will go back to Ryup, I'm sure I will, to be writing about them, but uh, at the moment I'm, I'm sort of knee deep in toffee, if you like, and I've had to make toffee at home just to get the smell of it going, so I could, I could write about it. Now then, as part of writing about the toffee factory in Chesley Street, I, um, I've been working with Chesley Street Heritage Society, and the chair of the society said, why don't you have one of your toffee factory girls fall in love with a soldier at Elizabethville? And I said, what's Elizabethville? Has anybody heard of it? Again, it's like the women's Christmas. I just, I didn't know anything about it. Elizabethville, spelt with an S, because it was named after the Belgian queen, was a village of Belgian people in Burtley. Um, it was run as a military camp. Um, it was run under Belgian law. And it's all documented. And the reason it's all documented, and if you have a look online, you'll, you'll find so much information about Elizabethville. The reason it's so well documented is because of this chap um, on the cover of this book. He was Elizabethville's official photographer. It's an amazing, I was just magical when I found out about this. So I've been working with Berkeley Heritage Group as well, and they took me on a walk of what remains of Elizabethville, although there isn't much left, is it? a rusty iron gate and an old building that's got a blue plaque on it, but that's about it. Um, so Elizabethville features in the book as well, and it's just been an absolute joy to find out about these things and to write about them too. 
So I have been using some of the toffee factories in Sunderland as well as part of the research for the toffee factory girls. Again, thank you to Sunderland Antiquarian Society for the pictures. And because toffee, toffee was always seen as the, you know, the poor relation to chocolate. So they had to try a little bit harder with their advertising. So again, if you, there's lots and lots of old tins, dainty diner tins of toffee that's available for sale. You can buy them on eBay. Um, they're just amazing, absolutely beautiful. And there was a Cremona toffee as well in Sunderland. We had the Mayfair toffee and Cremona toffee in Sunderland. So that's it, that's me. Um, I'll, I'm open to, to answering any questions at all, whether it's about riot, me, books, writing, any, anything you like. Um, earlier today, before you all arrived, um, we had some photographers in from Sunderland University. And the reason they were here is that I, this year for the first time, and I hope it won't be the last time, uh, I've been able to sponsor a student, a creative writing student at Sunderland University. So, the, you know, if, if the, the criteria for the student was that they were the first in their family to go to university, just as I was, uh, that they came from Sunderland, and that they came from um, sort of a low economic background. So it was, it was just someone like me. If I can help other people, then I certainly will. So it, it's been an absolute honour. And thank you so much for, uh, for, for coming along and listening. It's been great. Thank you. <laughs>